So my name is Gabriel Barajas. I work for AS Cantabria. And today I'm going to present my work, which is entitled Novel Methodology for a Fast Three-Dimensional three <clears throat> Numeric Analysis of the PTO Damping Force on a Dual Chamber Oscillating Water Column. So the motivation of my work is that the linear interaction between waves and the oscillating water column, what is the wave and it converters, has become in the recent years one of the biggest challenges for wave power interaction, for wave power industry. So the goal, the goals of my presentations is to reduce the computational cost and present an exhaustive analysis of the behavior of a dual chamber oscillating water column, and to compare the results, the numerical results, with some experimental data. So this is the index of my presentation. I will start with some objectives. Then I will go through the methodology. I will, I will use two approaches. The first one is the incompressible approach in which we're gonna be using interphone and IH phone. The second one is a compressible approach. And then we're gonna be using the compressible interphone and a new software that we have developed for this particular work, which is called IH compressible interporous form. I will validate both approaches and I will end up with some conclusions and future work. So by means of the CFD, of course, computational fluid dynamics and a numerical model, we are going to create a novel methodology for a fast three-dimensional numerical analysis of the PTO dumping force on a dual oscillating, a dual chamber oscillating water column. Okay, so we, we are gonna choose the dual chamber oscillating water column because two chambers we can maximize the efficiency and because it can protect as well the coastal areas, which is uh, something which is quite important for in our work. How are we gonna do this? By means of an American model, of course, open phone, we're gonna reproduce a set of, a set of experiments. Those experiments were carried out in, in Portugal, in Lenec laboratory. So they have this irregular wave film, which is 30 meter long, you can see it here. Uh, it has a cross section can, that can vary between one meter to 0 0.6 meters. The water depth can vary from 0 0.684 meters to 0 0.384 meters. The geometrical scale is one over 25, and we have play, placed several wave gauges along the wind flume to measure things. Then our dual chamber oscillating water column uh, model is one meter tall. Uh, one meter long and has a cross section of 0 0.5 meters. Each chamber has holes of 0 0.24 meters, or sorry, of 0 0.026 meters. And we have put multiple uh, air pressures and uh, free surface elevations inside the chambers to measure uh, all the variables. So, what do we mean by fast? And this is probably the most important part of, of the work. So we want to do things fast and in, to, to do some preliminary results. So by means of a new novel methodology, we're gonna try to speed up simulations. So we have chosen three configurations. The first one is to model the PTO as in the experiments, which means that we're gonna put holes in the top of the chambers to reproduce ge ge geometrically the same configurations as in the experimental setup you can see on the top. And then we're gonna use two other different approaches a second one in which we are not going to use those holes, but we're going to define it as a produce median using the Forheimer's equations. We're going to characterize the parameters of the Forheimer equations using the Van Gend expressions. The third one is to model these holes as a reduction in momentum equation by imposing a drag force. I'm going to move this so we can see. Okay, so we have replaced the two holes by two bonus areas. So here we're explaining the Forheimer equations that we've been presenting in the, in the last uh, uh, workshops. In the top, we have the Forheimer formula. And here we are defining following the Wangen expressions for the uh, friction coefficient L A for beta, which is the nonlinear friction coefficient, and, the, and C, which is the added mass coefficient. Apart from that, we have to define the D50 and the porosity. For the second approach, we have tested several uh, configurations, and we end up with this, this second one, in which the drag force mm -hmm. is a constant times the velocity plus another constant times the velocity square. For the whole work, we're going to use those parameters, those ones for the Forkheimer equations, and for the drag force 
reduction. So, as we want to make things fast, we have carried out two sensitive, sensitive studies. The first one is the mesh discretization. We have created with, uh, we have started with a, a first mesh and we have uh, reduced it uh, twice. So we can see that we are getting almost the same results. So we ha it, ha it has revealed that the coarser mesh is accurate enough for our design, for our purpose of this work, which means fast. I'm going to put this word in, in several slices because this is uh, at the end one of our main purposes. So the final mesh, it has a numerical discretization of 0 0.0.65 in the X direction, 0 0.05 meters in the Y, and 0 0.025 meters in the Z direction. Two refinement areas have been carried out around the fissure space and around the PTO and the oscillate, dual chamber oscillating water column. The next sensitive study was the domain. We can replicate the whole plume as in experiments, or we can try to reduce it to speed up the simulations. So in the first simulation, we have done the as, as, as in the experiments, which is a, a, a numerical domain of uh, 32, almost 33 meters. And in the second one, we have tried almost to divide it for half of it, and we use it 30 meters. Here we are showing the comparison between the experimental results and these two. Uh, cases. On the top, we have the air pressures inside the chambers, and on the lower part, we have the fissure space elevations inside the chambers. And we can see that we have a good agreement. And again, as we're trying to speed up all these things, <clears throat> we're going to be choosing the second approach, the reduced domain. So once we have done this, we're going to start using our first approach, which is the uh, incompressible approach. So for the two first cases, sorry, for the first approach and, and, and the third approach, the third approach was with the holes and the third one was with the reduction in the momentum for, in the momentum with a, with a, a, a drag force, we we're gonna be using interphone. And with the, for the second uh, approach in which we have modeled those holes using the Forheimer equations, we're gonna be using IH foam. So this is, uh, we, have, we have run five, sets of uh, <clears throat> numerical tests. We are using always the K-omega SST as a turbulence model. This mesh is around 0 0.47 million cells, and we can run it in with two processors, and we can, and we have run uh, 40 seconds of numerical simulation. So here I just wanted to emphasize that for the first uh, approach, we are modeling as in the experiments the whole, and in the second and in the third approach, we are defining this produce area instead of the real holes. So we have placed multiple uh, free surface gauges along, around the wave room, but we are just gonna plot the results of those two, which are inside the chamber. And we have as well placed around 70 air pressure gauges, but we are just gonna plot those ones and those ones because we have the experimental data measured there as well. So, those are the equations that we already know. For the first and the third approach, we're gonna use Interphone. We're gonna use uh, ESI's uh, standard release, the version 2106. And for the second uh, approach, we're gonna be using uh, EIH phone, which is as well based on the uh, standard release of uh, ESI version 2106. So, we have developed a new version of IH foam. Now we can as as assure the conservancy of mass. How, we, how do we have defined, or how do we have created this new uh, uh, IH foam model? So we can create two uh, porous zones, two different porous zones. And now in, in this new model, we have bonded the, the VOF between zero and the porosity. Of course, outside the porous media, the porosity is one. So the VOF goes to, varies from zero to one. And inside those porous medias, the, poros the VOF varies from zero to the porosity. We can see that the velocity is, of course, damped inside those porous areas. And because it's the same fluid, the density must be kept constant, as we can see in the last uh, slides. Of course, we have validated this, this new model with the classical leak experiments, four dam breaks with uh, two different kinds of materials, the glass beds and the and the and the crusted rocks for two different uh, 
uh, initial uh, wave heights. And then once you have done this, we have extended this, uh, this new porous media solder to the overset, overset framework in order to be able to resolve tsunami generated by submerged landslides. So here I'm just plotting the, some results for one of the cases. This is a water depth of 0.384 meters, a wave height of 0 0.035 meters and a period of two seconds. On top, we are plotting the free surface elevations of those two sensors that were inside the chamber. And in lower part, we are, plot we are plotting their pressure inside the chamber as well. So we can see that we have, we can see that we have a good agreement between experimental data, the first approach, which is the holes, the second approach, which, is, which was just doing the holes by this for Heimer equations and, and the momentum zones, and the third one. If we now check about the times, the third approach seems to be faster, 40% uh, time faster. So it's the one that I would like to, to, to use for, for my preliminary results. If we plot the results, for example, for another case, the third one, uh, we get more or less the same results. We are having a good agreement between the, th the three numerical approaches. So we always go, we are always going, going to go for the last one, for, for, for the fastest one. Here are some videos. Okay. Something that is important to point out is that uh, we are having for the second. Sorry, it's not, it's not, the video is not moving. Okay. Something that is important to, to point out is that we are not solving, we are not resolving here the, the real, what real happens in the vicinity of the PTO. And therefore we are having here velocities which are 10 times bigger than the real one, okay? But if we just, re, if we just take care of what it happens in this, areas in which we have measured the, the pressure or the physical phase elevation, the results are quite good. So something that I want to point out here is, the, is that the oscillated water column behaves differently for different wave conditions. And this is great, which means that we can use open phone for making a lot of preliminary studies. But for this particular case or this particular setup, Chamber one is more efficient for lower periods and chamber number two is more efficient for higher periods. Now we're gonna go for the compressible approach. As we have seen that the third one is the fastest one, we're gonna get rid of the Forheimer equations. And now we're just gonna use the compressible interphone for solving the holes and the third approach, which was to substitute the holes by uh, a drag force applying to the momentum equations. So we are using the same messages as before. We are using the same cases, same turbulence model, and now we have to add temperature. The experiments were carried out in Portugal in spring, so we didn't measure the temperature, of course, and I just put 20 as, as, a, as an input, 20 degrees. So now those equations are a bit different. As before, we have the navier stokes equation, the BOF equation, but now we have to add as well the energy equation. We have modeled the air as a perfect gas, gas with its own equation of state, and the water as well, it has been uh, defined as a perfect liquid, liquid with its own equation of state. So now here I'm plotting what we have done before, the three incompressible approaches, the experimental one, and now I'm adding as well these two new compressible uh, results. So we can see that more or less, we have a good agreement between all the numerical uh, solutions. And sometimes the experimental data, we can see that we have some, some discrepancies. So if I see this kind of results, of course, as I'm always trying to do, uh, or I'm trying to obtain a fast solution, I will go for a third case. So, So as before, I'm just plotting here uh, another video. On top is the free surface elevation. Here on green, we can see the temperature, velocities, and 
velocities on, on, on the water, velocities around the, the, PTO, the PTO. So on the top, we can see that we are, we are getting, uh, oh, we, we, can, we can go the other way around. As before, we can see that here we're having velocities which are 10 times uh, uh, smaller than the other ones, higher. I think I have switched up the, the videos, okay? Because this one, is, this one is 10 times bigger, so I just put it on in, in a different way. So we can see something which is important is we can see that whenever uh, the waves compress the, the air, so we have uh, the, temp the temperature is going to be increased. And whenever the, the water level is going to decrease, the temperature is going to decrease. Okay? You can see it again. As before, here I'm just putting some snapshots of our five uh, test cases, now with a, a compressible approach. As before, we can see that the oscillating water column behaves differently for different wave conditions. And again, this is great, which means that open foam can be a really useful tool for doing this kind of pre-analysis, okay? Which means that if we can vary the dimensions of the, of, of, of the, of the, of the oscillating water column, we can make it uh, taller or, 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 or smaller or whatever, and we can do it in a very fast way if we compare it with, with laboratory uh, experiments. So, so far we have created a, a new methodology for doing this kind of fast pre-analysis. If we, as we have done it before, we can select one of the, one of the solutions for if it were a, a real, a real uh, case. So now that we have done it and we have selected our let's say best solution, we should be able to replicate what happens in laboratory, but in the sub way. So we have created this new solver, which is in IH compressible interporous foam, which is the compressible interfoam plus the IH foam. We need to add the porosity because if you remember in our experiments, we have some a dissipation beach to, to dissipate the waves. So we need to add the porosity in this, in this model. We are not taking into account what happens inside, what, how the temperature behaves inside the, this porosity model, because it's just a zone in which the waste are gonna be dumped. So now we're gonna replicate the exact uh, wave flume as in, in the uh, laboratory. This is of course a much bigger uh, numerical simulation. Now we have 3 million cells. Now we have to run it with eight processors and now we just have run 30 seconds. We are just running for, for the first case. Again, we're using k omega SST as the turbulence model and the temperature again is 20 degrees. So here I'm exploring the uh, velocity, the X velocity on the water on the top. Here we are exploring the free, sur the free surface elevation around the free, uh, free surface elevation. Here we are exploding velocities on the water and velocities uh, on the air. And here we are exploding as well the temperature. Something that I want to point out is we have these tiny holes. The structure was not completely fitting the wave flume. And this might cause, or, or it was causing, that our time step was too small. Okay? And that was the beginning of, of how to develop this new methodology. We tend to speed up simulations so our clients spend less money. We have happier clients and normally happier, happier bosses. And, and, and we can see that we have a very good res resolution or, or our answer around, around the PTO for, for, the, for, the, for the year. So yeah, I'm just putting my conclusions and some future work. So a, no, a novel dual chamber resident water column is studied in CSD with three different approaches, holes, we have used the Forheimer equation for modeling the porous media and as well uh, drag force uh, added into the momentum equation. We have seen that the third approach is faster, is the fastest one, and that we can use it to provide some preliminary results really fast and accurate. Of course, with those results, we cannot simulate what happens in the vicinity of the PTO because we are not reproducing the, the holes. Something that we'd like to do in the, in the future, of course, is to update the work that Benedetto, May did, Benedetto Di Paolo did in his PhD and added the compressibility 
to the one way and to wake up in methodologies. My, slides, my slide, last slide is about the fourth Iberian Fund that we are going to uh, host in September in Santander, the 21st and 22nd of, uh, in, in Santander. Uh, we have more than 40 oral presentations already that has been submitted. We are very happy. We are gonna have 40 notes and, and, and anyone that is interesting, we, we, we will be happy to, to answer any of the questions. That's all. Thank you very much for your attention and I'll open to, to your questions. Thank you for a very good work. I wanted to ask you about the choice of team that they are compressing all this from. Because from what I see, you don't have conditional energy in the team. That's one. And also, your temperature variation is less than 0 0.1 degrees. So you yeah. could have used buoyancy if you wanted it or not. Yes. Is there a particular reason? No, I just did it. Oof. Uh, so, uh, Professor Hasak is asking me why do I have chose this particular energy equation and not another one. Uh, it was it was the first try, uh, and right now uh, we are thinking of doing something else. And I, I was speaking with some of of, of, of the colleagues here in the in the conference, and we I believe that now we have to focus in two ways. We have to try to to do this numerical simulations really, really, really that, that matches the, the physics. But in the other way, we have to create these new methodologies for small consultancies that, that so they can afford to, to use open phone in a, in a fast and, and accurate way. So we are using both ways. And now, of course, we want to, to investigate further than this. As I said before, I don't care about the temperature inside the porous media, and there's plenty of papers about that. But this, 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 is, this is the beginning of, of the work. Thank you. It's very simple right now. It's very easy. If you try to do a 2D, um, uh, 2D solution to compare with 2D, you can not some gain in the Not really, but, but as, as, as we have those holes and Oh, yes. yes, so we, we are not supposed to do it. Yes, but but we, we can do it as well. But the idea is, sorry. So so it is very important for us what happens around here. If we make it two D, you will miss all that information. Of course, it can be as well a very fast a fast way to make the first preliminary research. But but this third case, almost in two days, it can it can be run with. Even one single possession in my in my in my computer, so I think it's, it's good enough. Okay, so the next speaker is actually the first one, but his computer was not working, um, so he rebooted it. I hope Eric is now online. So Eric, do you hear me? Yes. All right, yes, we can see your screen. So Eric, the floor is yours. All right, yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Eric Higgins. I'm a graduate student, a PhD student at Virginia Tech, and uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend in person. I was planning to, but I got sick this weekend, so I couldn't travel, and so... I'm here presenting over Zoom about uh, generating geophysical data using OpenFOAM and using that to generate simulated remote sensing data. So the motivation, uh, OpenFOAM is a very capable tool for simulating the near field flows around a ship. So the, the turbulence due to the different structures and the hull itself. But what if we wanted to simulate a, a ship wake many, many kilometers downstream? So you can see on the right in this figure, on the order of tens to hundreds of kilometers. What sort of factors will we need to consider for that? And is this possible to do so? And if so, we would like to be able to use the simulated data to, to generate any sort of simulated remote sensing data. 
And so the size of this domain, uh, the ship waste can persist for days and they can last for tens of hundreds of kilometers downstream. And so to put some numbers into this domain, so a depth of 200 meters, a uh, cross wake width of two kilometers and simulating the wake up to 25 kilometers downstream of the ship, that is a, a volume of 7.5 cubic kilometers, which is very large section, well, a relatively small section of the ocean in the grand scheme of things, but still very large compared to our ship. And so in order to achieve one meter resolution in every direction, we need seven and a half billion cells. And that's not even accounting for the, any sort of near field simulation. So we would not be able to uh, resolve the boundary layer with a one meter resolution. So we need even, even more cells than 7.5 billion. And so given just the cost of, of uh, doing that simulation, just uh, at, at minimum seven and a half billion cells, we started looking into uh, some simplifying assumptions just to make things uh, more tractable. And so the first one is that we replace the near field hydrodynamic simulation with empirical initial conditions that represent a ship weight. So we don't have to resolve the, the boundary layer. Instead, we initialize uh, an initial velocity and turbulence wake. And we, we uh, use that as a wake profile. Our second assumption is that we assume that the wake is approximately steady relative to the moving ship. And so we can get rid of any sort of time dependence with respect to the frame of the ship, frame of reference of the ship. And then finally, another simulation, uh, simplification that we perform is instead of simulating this full 3D ship fixed domain, we simulate the ship passing through a one cell thick earth fixed domain. And so this domain is allowed to vary in time. And so this is akin to using a Galilean transform where you can turn time into a spatial coordinate by multiplying it by velocity. And so instead of having this large block that you see on the left, we have a number of different slices that are all one cell thick at different time steps. And so we can take those time steps, multiply them by the, the ship's speed, and offset them to reconstruct this full 3D domain. And this isn't, while it is one cell thick, it's not a 2D simulation. We, it, there's still full three dimensions. So there is uh, the streamwise component of velocity. And so, but we are using periodic boundary conditions to, to maintain this. And so the same two kilometer by 200 meter by one meter or one cell thick domain at one meter resolution is now less than half a million cells. So a 99.9996% reduction in cells. And so this is very nice because now we can, we can simulate this for a, a long time and include even a larger section of ocean if we'd like to. However, there are some limitations. There, there is no free lunch with this approach. So this, the domain is only one cell thick. And with periodic boundary conditions, the X derivative is zero everywhere in the domain. So the derivative in and out, into and out of the domain. And so we can reconstruct these X derivatives post hoc, again, by using that Galilean transform. However, during the course of the simulation, this X derivative is locally zero. And so this assumes implicitly that the wake is not evolving rapidly in the streamlined direction. Another issue that we run into is that time only moves in one direction, whereas a, an incompressible flow is able to exert an influence in surroundings in all directions. And so we do lose some of that, that information. So we're assuming that upstream portions of the wake are negligibly uh, interfered, upon, interfered with by downstream portions of the wake. So diving into some of the governing equations, we use a modified buoyant boost nest pimple foam solver that comes standard with open foam. And so with this, it is a, an incompressible fluid, divergence free. The temperature transport seen at the bottom, we are using temperature to maintain a stratification. The environment is assumed here to be isohaline. 
Then looking at forcing within this domain, since it is stratified, there is a, a buoyancy component. And here we're assuming that we're looking at wakes short enough that Coriolis forces uh, can be neglected. And so we are also not simulating the free surface. Since our domain is only two-dimensional, it's very difficult to, if not impossible, to resolve the free surface in that matter. But we can still include the, the effects of swell using uh, Craig Leibovich vortex force function. And this allows a Stokes drift to be incorporated into the domain. And this will interact, the swell will interact with the vehicle wake to produce a vortex force. And this, this does have a, a significant impact on the downstream wake. This, with the, the presence of swell and the direction of swell will have a, has a great variation with uh, the final wake. Although uh, I don't, I'm not gonna be going into this too much here. The turbulence model is a standard K epsilon model, but that has been modified to include a buoyancy production term. So if you're familiar with the K epsilon model, these two first two equations should look very familiar. There's an additional GK term, and that is a, a buoyancy production term due to the stratification. So a stable environment will have a negative production. So stable environment will suppress turbulence, but an unstable environment, a statically unstable environment will amplify turbulence. Going to some of the boundary conditions, the ocean surface, we're simulating this as a rigid lid. And so this is, uh, we're prescribing a free slip boundary condition upon the surface, as well as on the bottom surface. The lateral boundaries on the sides are outlet boundaries with numerical beaches being applied to the outermost edges. To This is to prevent internal gravity waves from reflecting off of these boundaries back into the domain and interfering with the ship wake. And as I mentioned before, the streamwise boundaries are periodic. Those, those are the boundaries in the, the plus minus X direction. Now the initial conditions, as I mentioned, this we're, we have a representative ship wake and these are based off a, a semi-empirical model that's adapted by, uh, from Miner et al. And we're, the vessel we're simulating is a, a twin propeller vessel. The, you can see this uh, paper by some of our, our coworkers, Samero et al. They have a full list of the ship dimensions, uh, if you're curious. It's a rather large set of dimensions and equations. So I, I, for the sake of conciseness, I have omitted them from these slides. However, you can see the, the velocity, I apologize, the label got cut off there. The, this is the velocity magnitude on the top. And then this is the uh, log of TKE on the bottom. And so you can see there's different regions. We have the propeller region below. And then we also have the friction, uh, the drag wake on the ship hull, as well as the bow waves. And these all create, these all introduce turbulence into the environment as well as a, a change to velocity. And we also assume that the propellers mix the, the fluid. So there is a temperature stratification in one of the simulations. And so the, we're assuming that the propellers evenly mix this fluid so that it creates a region of equal temperature. And we use the, the open foam utility set expression fields to set all these initial conditions. It's, it's very useful for, for handling walls of about two dozen equations and parameters. And overall, it's a very nice tool. And looking at some of the stratifications here, we're testing two environments. Uh, both of them are isohaline. However, they have a different temperature stratification. One has a 20 meter deep thermocline that is all isothermal. But below this, there's a linear temperature stratification. And then in the other case, there's a linear temperature stratification throughout all the way up to the, the ocean surface. And density is modeled using the TOS 10 equation of state in both of these simulations. So we ran these cases out for uh, in time three three uh, three thousand six hundred seconds, so an hour, 
And when we transform this using the Galilean transform, this gives us a wake of about 25 kilometers long. And so taking a look at some of the results on the ocean surface, the, the cross wake velocity, so this is going side, uh, perpendicular to the direction of ship travel. The, and all of these figures, the, the ship is located at the origin, traveling from right to left. And so you can see when there's the 20 meter thermocline, so the, the 20 meter deep region of equal temperature fluid, you can see the development of, uh, of some convergence and divergent zones. This is due to the interaction between the, the, the swell direction and the, the ship wake. And then on the right, in the linear stratification, we can see that it, we don't see the same pattern. And this is due to the stratification going all the way up to the surface. This forms internal gravity waves when the, the ship propellers mix up the fluid. And so this does interfere with the, this creates a different pattern in the ship wake. Now, surface temperature deviation for the, the case with the 20 meter deep isothermal region, we didn't see anything, any sort of temperature deviation outside numerical noise. But for the linear stratification, we can see that there's a, a, a pocket of cold water that's been, that been brought up to the surface due to the mixing up by the ship. And this persists for the, the 25 kilometers downstream. Uh, the, and the next, we're looking at the TKE, turbulent kinetic energy. So in both cases, you can see that uh, the, temp, the TKE drops off pretty rapidly. However, in the case with the linear stratification, the, the stratification suppresses much of the turbulence, so that decays much faster than the case with the, the isothermal layer. And looking at epsilon TKE dissipation, this is the, the log of TKE dissipation. We see a, a similar pattern where the linear stratification suppresses the epsilon as well. And so this is all one step. That was a lot that I've covered. However, this is for generating remote sensing data. This is just one step. This is, in fact, if you can see my mouse, this is the first three, the top three blue boxes, where we begin with the 2D initial data plane. We perform our hydrodynamic simulation. Then we reconstruct our surface data. Then there, but there are other steps, both within open foam and outside of open foam. I won't touch on, I won't go into too much detail on the ones that are external to open foam, just because this is the open foam workshop. However, the we can open foam does have the we can use the tools provided within open foam to extract all of the data we need. And then we can feed that into different models and then generate infrared and so, uh, synthetic aperture radar images, which I'll, I'll present a few examples in, this, in these slides. And so that, that was the, just the first step. And so the next step after that, once we've reconstructed the surface data is we perform a 2D surfactant redistribution simulation. So we extract all of the data on the ocean surface on a 2D plane across all of those time steps. And then we perform a scalar redistribution simulation that I'm, I won't go into too much detail here. This, uh, these surfactants, these include film and other biological or non-biological matter on the surface that may modify local surface tension and which, uh, which does affect the wind wave spectrum. And so these wind waves might be important to uh, remote sensing applications such as SAR images. And so just to, to quickly step over the, the remote sensing models, uh, I won't go into, again, not too much detail because I could spend another 30 minutes here on just these models. Uh, once we have the surfactant redistribution simulation, we can solve for the surface wave spectral density. And this is solved in a model called Aram Ocean Model, EOM. And so this is a, a 4D set of equations, two spatial coordinates and two wave number dimensions. Which, and so this has to be solved in a different solver. And this surface wave spectrum is a function of the, the turbulence, the surfactant distributions, as well as uh, things like the, the 
the surface currents. We can also use EOM to simulate synthetic aperture radar. And then we can also take some of the, the surface data and we can simulate IR simulations that have been, uh, been built in MATLAB. And this uses a mixture of analytic and empirical models. So some of the some of the outputs that we can see from these uh, remote sensing simulations, you can see here. These are both uh, synthetic aperture radar images. So the one on the left is uh, S band SAR, and the one on the right is L band SAR. Again, the one on the left for the 20 meter deep isothermal region, the one on the right for the linear stratification. And you can just see how the the wakes look different in the SAR image. And so these SAR bands uh, do vary in frequency. And so this means that different size waves will reflect these radar band, uh, radar waves differently. So they will highlight different features of the ocean, even beyond just looking at these different simulations, how they develop differently. <laughs> and all of these images are, even though we are, I'm presenting them as a square here for, uh, for visual clarity, they are uh, one and a half kilometers tall and then 25 kilometers long. And so these are not presented to scale. And similarly for the, uh, the IR, you can see here on the left, uh, the, this is the simulation with a 20 meter deep isothermal layer. And because infrared is looking for differences in temperature, we don't see any we don't see the uh, presence of a wake on the surface, even though we can see it in the SAR image. But on the right, with the linear stratification, since there was that region of cold water that was brought to the surface, that shows up as a dark streak in the infrared. And another thing to, to point out here is that the image on the right, you don't see any of those internal gravity waves, while you do see them in, uh, in the SAR image here. So these two different uh, sensor modalities will pick up different sets of physics. And so just uh, to go over the conclusion of future work, uh, I discussed the simplifications that are necessary for simulating a, a persistent ship wake of this scale. And then also outline the flow of data from open foam simulations to the different external simulation tools. And it just showed what type of simulation data, uh, simulated remote sensing data can be built from this uh, open foam data. So future work in involves uh, incorporating new sets of physics models, so turbulence models and uh, different surfactant models. So for example, the, the turbulence model tested doesn't account for the fact that the free surface will suppress turbulence in the normal direction. And so we're looking into incorporating this uh, suppression into the turbulence model. So thank you all for your time and attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Eric, for a nice presentation. Any questions from the audience? I will also check the online chat. No question. I, I do have a question, Eric. Um, yeah. Th this morning, there was also a, a session on naval hydrodynamics, and it turned out that people working with ships really like to see validation data. So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, is there any way to, to validate your numerical model? Uh, so different coworkers have uh, validated different parts of it. One of the big issues is that uh, you can only get so much data in the real world. It's also very costly to get that data. And so we have examples of SAR images that appear qualitatively similar. And so still need to examine whether they're quantitatively similar. So yeah, that, that's something that we're definitely looking into for more of like the full scale validation. OK, thanks. And good luck with that. Any more questions? I don't think so. So let's thank the speaker again. And thank you, Eric.
Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sanya Jurasic, PhD student and research assistant, assistant at the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering and Naval Architecture, University of Zagreb. Uh, I'm working with Professor Jasek at his uh, CFD research group, and I mainly focused in naval hydrodynamics, uh, particularly uh, for my PhD thesis, I'm investigating the ship propeller rudder interaction, uh, different approaches uh, on modeling the propeller, uh, observing both the integral, integral and uh, local flow effects in the scope of that study. Uh, I know it's late. Uh, I try to be short, not to uh, exhaust you with uh, equations. So I'm going to briefly present you the results of my study up to now. Uh, basically, in this study, uh, there was some implementation regarding the discretized propeller approach and the overset grid technique, uh, but uh, the base is to compare the discretized rotating propeller approach and the actuator disk approach for predicting the self uh, propulsion of a model ship. Uh, okay. Okay, uh, so why? Uh, as you know, all know, uh, you are all involved in now hydrodynamics. Uh, the main reason why to do all of that are the estimations of the propulsion characteristics during the preliminary design stage of a ship. Uh, that can range from predicting the self-propulsion coefficients which are necessary for the estimation of propeller design to a more detailed analysis of the trend, transient effects. Uh, usually model tests are performed up to now. Uh, they are based on the extrapolation procedures, but, but as you know, we cannot perform both the fraud and the Reynolds number at the same time. So that's a little bit questionable, especially that came to, let's say the front line of the research uh, recently in some recent works uh, published. Uh, also, uh, the International Maritime Organization introduced regulations regarding the energy efficiency, both of the new and the existing ships, which also increases the necessity for the computational fluid dynamics in predicting uh, uh, power curves and uh, trying to reduce uh, the uh, losses of the ships. So, uh, brief overview of this study. Uh, first, we performed a flow field study of a model ship without a propeller. Why we did that? Uh, we decided to use the dynamic overset grid for the, the discretized propeller, and we wanted to be sure how much the interpolation in the fringe layer which is uh, actually the most critical stuff when you're using the dynamic overset grid influences the accuracy of the result. Later on, uh, the actuator disk model, uh, which is implemented two, two different ways. First one is, is a little bit simpler that uh, only introduces the trust effects to the flow. And the other one is the one that introduces both the trust and the momentum or torque effects uh, via tangential velocity jump and also as you said we like to perform validations verifications and we did that also in this study uh, the ship using this study is uh, well known the cruiser container ship and uh, here are some of the particulars of the model i won't uh, read them out to you right now because you probably did some calculations with this geometry in your research previously uh, okay, uh, this here uh, is the discretized domain used in the flow field study. Uh, the grid consists of three independently uh, discretized domains. Uh, the blue one is the background uh, block grid. Uh, the red one is the grid uh, fitted to the ship hull. And that yellow one in the region of the rotating propeller is just a cylindrical uh, domain in, in which we uh, prescribe the rotation as there is uh, some propeller also to observe uh, the effect on the wake 
behind the propeller due to the interpolation and the rotation effect. So let's go to the result. Uh, those are uh, the result of the wave profiles for different Y planes. And uh, both cases with the overset approach and without the overset approach are compared to the experimental data which are publicly uh, available. Uh, I think that they're uh, took, took, uh, taken from the Tokyo 2015 uh, work workshop. Uh, yeah, you can observe there are some uh, differences that are visible when it comes to the uh, wave profiles if the dynamic overset uh, grid is used, but they are not so vertical. Uh, to avoid that uh, error, we choose for the self-propulsion calculation not to discretize uh, the ship hull in a way to use a background and the foreground grid, so to be on the safe side. Uh, also, uh, the velocity, 25% uh, of the propeller diameter behind the propeller plane was sampled, and uh, those are the results uh, that are obtained with CFD calculations. Uh, both uh, uh, the uh, first one is with the, without the overset, and the second one is with the overset. Also, there are some discrepancies visible, but they are acceptable. Then we decide, okay, uh, we are observing the self-propulsion. We want to predict the power curve, but how to do it efficiently and not to spend too much computational time and money to obtain good results. So we define a method. Uh, you can see it in this flow chart. Uh, first, the idea was, okay, let's perform a self-propulsion calculations using the simplified uh, actuator disk approach. Uh, during those calculations, the two degrees of freedom were allowed, and namely heave and pitch. And uh, the propeller rotation right, rate is updated uh, according to the uh, equation presented uh, in this flow chart. And the set point was equal uh, to the skin friction coefficient, which, which takes into account the differences of viscous resistance between the full and model scale. From that uh, calculations, the output that we use later on in the calculations with the discretized rotating propeller was uh, were the dynamic sinkage and trim and the value of the thrust. Uh, later on, we use that information obtained with so-called cheap calculation. Uh, and use them as an input for the discretized rotating propeller, propeller calculation. Uh, in this calculation, we also updated the ro propeller rotation rate, but this time also to gain some increase at the set point was equal to the thrust obtained from the actuator, uh, this calculation. This may be a little bit dis discutable, but from the experience and some other uh, geometries and projects that we've done that showed as uh, accurate enough approach, let's say it's so. Uh, the output from this more detailed uh, calculation are both the integral values, propulsion characteristics, factors, uh, and also the local flow phenomena in the region around the stern and behind the propeller. Uh, okay, let's go further. A uh, little bit about the implemented the appendage motion controller. Uh, actually, we tested, it's not presented here in the results, but uh, we tested the two approaches. First one was to obtain the longitudinal force equilibrium, which is actually uh, when you want to uh, obtain the skin friction correction value. And uh, in scope of that algorithm, uh, first, the residual force is calculated, then thrust and uh, torque are calculated. Uh, propeller rotation rate is uh, updated using the PID controller. Uh, and then the swept angle is calculated after what, which one, after what uh, the uh, propeller points are updated in the simulation. And the other one that we used in this research is with the specified thrust. I won't go over that. 
because it's uh, really similar, just uh, different uh, approach when it comes to the controller's set point. Uh, results obtained with this methodology are uh, verified using the generalized research of extrapolation with the uh, factor of uh, safety method, uh, which uh, uses the ratio of the uh, observed and theoretical order to calculate the uncertainty. Uh, those are the equations that are uh, used to calculate the factor of safety and the uncertainties, uh, both spatial and temporal uh, uncertainties were calculated uh, just to point out the grid uh, was generated using the CF mesh. So I'm not sure, probably you used it in your work. Uh, there's not uh, much options for, for control of a mesh. We try to do our best, but it was not as ideal and not all assumptions for using this method of uh, verification are uh, fulfilled. Uh, therefore, we observe some greater values of uncertainty values. But on the other side, we use the factor of safety method, which uh, is, let's say, more conservative than standard grid convergence index method, which uses a factor of 1.25, I think, in calculations. Here, some factors are over five, six, seven, and so on. Uh, Validation was performed uh, according to the ITTC standard. Uh, obtained values are presented in uh, this table and uh, validation is achieved at the validation uncertainty level uh, because the relative differences error was less the, than the uh, verification uncertainty. Here are presented the integral flow values for the discretized propeller approach, actuator disk approach, uh, which uses the tangential velocity jump and the pressure jump, and the less complex one with the pressure jump. Uh, and I won't uh, go into details of all of those characteristics, but overall, uh, good agreement with the experimental data are observed. Uh, uh, one thing to notice are the differences in the rotative efficiency, hull efficiency, and overall propulsive efficiency, which are caused by uh, the errors in uh, truss deduction factor and the wake fraction. Uh, results obtained in this research are compared with the other results uh, that were submitted to the Tokyo 2015 workshop from other contestants. And uh, we actually are in really good agreement when compared to them, when it comes to the integral flow values, there's not, not significant uh, deviations. Uh, now uh, let's go a little bit over the local flow characteristics. Uh, this is the same uh, plane, 25% uh, of the propeller diameter behind the propeller plane. Uh, and uh, those are, uh, non-dimensional axial velocity contours. Uh, the first figure uh, presents the experimental data and uh, discretized propeller data and the actor this data are presented on other figures. As you can see, only the discretized propeller, as expected, were able to capture the moving crescent-like region on uh, of high velocity zone on the right uh, side of the uh, figure while uh, neither of the actors or these methods were able to capture it. But when it comes to the asymmetry of the profile, only uh, the actor or this model that is using the pressure jump uh, were full symmetrical because, as expected, as, as expected, it doesn't introduce the uh, momentum effect into the. Uh, flow. Uh, those are uh, cross flow velocity vectors. Uh, to notice here are the main vortex in the propeller uh, disk region and the smaller one counter rotating vortex in the right upper corner. Uh, 
what was surprising is that also uh, the architect of this model, which was more uh, detailed, uh, who, which uses the tangential velocity jump and the pressure uh, jump, uh, is also capable to capture it. But uh, the other one, uh, less complex one, failed to do so. Uh, also, the velocity profiles uh, were sampled uh, in the same uh, plane and they are compared to the experimental uh, data. Uh, regarding the axial velocity component, uh, the main disagreement are near the uh, hub. Uh, what's the problem here? The problem is that the cap of the hub is unknown. Uh, I was investigating a little bit when I was doing that research, uh, why are there such discrepancies and uh, found out from other researchers that perform similar studies that practically everyone uses different cap for calculations using this uh, propeller. But overall, uh, even not uh, presented in this figure, uh, the velocity profiles obtained with the discretized propeller approach are in good agreement with the other ones from uh, the published papers. Uh, this uh, act at this model, was able to, let's say, good enough, capture the axial velocity, especially in the jet flow uh, region. Uh, but when it comes to the Y and Z components, it was not so good as you can see. Uh, so to conclude, uh, the integral values obtained from the actuator disk model, which is uh, much cheaper, are quite accurate and it can be used as an input for the computation with the discretized propeller model, or if you are uh, interested only in integral values regarding the self-propulsion characteristics or the uh, propeller delivered uh, power. Uh, obviously, the more detailed actuator this model provided proved to be slightly more accurate in terms of flow quantities than the less complex actuator this model. Uh, the main problem, uh, which uh, I investigated later on, also not in this study, is that uh, the way that the actuator disk, disk is implemented is that uh, it's based on the assumption of the infinite bladed disk. And it actually doesn't take into account, uh, as the propeller do, the effect of the inflow velocity on the position and the number of the propeller blades. Uh, so the uniform inflow velocity distribution is assumed that that's mainly the biggest uh, problem if you are trying to observe uh, local flow quantities with the actor to this model implemented in this way. Uh, discretized propeller approach is more appropriate to obtain the local flow characteristics and to observe the propeller ship interaction at the expense of overall uh, cost. And the good agreement with the experimental data are observed. Uh, uh, because I'm short in time, I didn't went in all the details that were uh, done to perform this study, but uh, actually yesterday uh, this paper uh, was uh, online published in Ocean Engineering. So if anyone's interested in more details, uh, how we did it and uh, any uh, recommendations or have additional questions, I can send me an email so we can discuss. It. And with that, I would finish my presentation. Okay. How long does it take the overset to achieve the same velocities at the disk approach? Sorry. How long does it take the overset approach to get the same velocities at the first approach to this, this disk approach? Uh, yeah, uh, you mean, uh, yeah, uh, if I understood well, the question is uh, how more efficient is the uh, 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 actuator disk approach when compared yeah. to the uh, 
a dynamic over with <laughs> well it's much more efficient because uh, overall the solver is implemented in a way that we can use uh, really really high current numbers and still obtain good integ integral values and as you know uh, when you have a flow and the two different time scales around the propeller and near the uh, near the hull you have a limitation regarding that so it took i'm not sure about the numbers now but it took uh, significantly longer to obtain uh, let's say averagely converged solution yeah. Okay, the question is, uh, did... Yeah, if I understood it well, the question is, uh, uh, did we use the AMI or the GGI uh, interface or sliding mesh interface to simulate the rotating propeller? Yes, actually, uh, we also performed that study, but it would be too much to put it out here. Uh, it's uh, the results are uh, quite good with the uh, GGI or AMI, uh, but uh, the experience that the uh, overset approach is more robust and it's much easier to discretize uh, the, the domain and set up, set up uh, the case, especially, for example, uh, if you have uh, energy saving devices and you have or ducts and you have those small gaps with the overset, we used to do it more easily. But on the other side, uh, when you're using overset, you can obtain a little bit more uh, spikes in pressure and things like that. And when you're using the GGI, the values are a little bit smoother, let's say so. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm asking about the discretized propeller approach. I understand that all your simulations are at model scale. Yep. Do you think the simulation results would be better or worse at full scale? Yeah, that's actually a great question. I have some results uh, uh, for this case, for the full scale. Also didn't put it there. Uh, uh, better results regarding the overall efficiency are for the full scale. In this case, for this hull. Why? Uh, I mean, that's practically another study that I'm conducting now. Uh, due to the di different uh, boundary layers in, and valence number, in full and model scale, when you observe uh, the inflow uh, velocities in front of the propeller in full scale and model scale, uh, in full scale they are averagely higher. And if you observe it, observe it in terms of cross flow vectors, which are important uh, uh, for the attack angle uh, uh, to the propeller blades, you see that propeller is. Uh, working in uh, more efficient conditions to express it that way and yeah that's it all right yeah and also 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 one thing to mention regarding the full scale it's good to observe it in terms of the propeller lo load in terms of the uh, uh, trust over uh, torque coefficient it's similar to like in aerodynamics when you are observing the air force uh, it tells you how efficiently the propeller is working. And when you observe those two uh, for the full scale and model scale, you can also see that not just averagely, but oral curves in, uh, in case of the full scale are like shifted up. And that also means that it's operating more efficient. Yeah. Uh, the second one, yeah. Okay, so in your simulation, you're using the actuator this method, yeah. which assumes that you're going to have a jump in thrust and torque yeah. across the entire surface of the disk. Okay. So a while back, I was considering the idea of actuator line, mm -hmm. where we would position, I don't know, four or five lines across the actuator disk mm -hmm. and concentrate 
the increase in thrust and torque on those lines and then allow the lines to rotate. Okay. The idea is that that would be able to create thick workers. Yeah. Do you have any opinions on that? Yeah. Uh... I didn't thought about that idea, to be honest. I'm more focused at the moment at the full disk test propeller and how to improve uh, the efficiency of those type of calculations. Uh, but the idea of a linear representation of the actuator of this model, hmm, it may be efficient, but I'm not sure how we'll improve the situation regarding the tip okay. vertices. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is William Lambert. I am a, a graduate PhD student at Virginia Tech. And I'm going to be presenting on free surface capturing techniques for volume of fluid cases with diminishing wave height. This is an ongoing project with my advisor, Dr. Stefano Brizolera. And really, if I could rename this project, it's just trials and tribulations of doing VOF simulations. Um, so, uh, to put a little plug into Virginia Tech and the work that we're doing there, uh, our work is conducted under the Virginia Tech iShip Research Group. Um, and that has close collaborations with the Virginia Tech Center for Marine Autonomy and Robotics. Um, and if you don't know, Virginia Tech is located in, up in the mountains of Virginia in the southwest corner of Virginia, located on a beautiful campus. And the Virginia Tech iShip team, which stands for Innovative Ship Design, does a load of different works focused on high speed, high efficiency propeller design, to high performance, high speed planing crafts and waves um, to different surface piercing, um, super cavitating hydrofoils and work that I do on viscous nonlinear sea keeping and maneuvering design. Um, and then the Virginia Tech Center for Marine Autonomy and Robotics is kind of our, our larger family headed by four different faculty uh, naval architect, a hydrodynamicist, an electrical engineer, and a control theorist. Um, and their focus is just on creating uh, different autonomous vehicles for different purposes. Um, so to give a quick agenda of what I'll be covering today, I'll be focused on a larger application, which is a Lagrangian-based nonlinear maneuvering and sea keeping model of near surface underwater vehicles operating in waves. And when I say Lagrangian here, it's not Lagrangian particles, it's more of the Lagrangian dynamical motions based on energy. I'll then go into the problem that I focused on, which is the accurate free surface capturing becoming increasingly difficult as wave deformations caused by these underwater bod bodies decrease. Uh, I then kind of developed a plan and I'll talk about that plan, which is particularly focusing meshing on the free surface and different numerical schemes to better capture the free surface in these cases where the free surface deformation decreases. And then I'll propose an idea that I haven't been able to implement. Maybe someone here would wanna take on the undertaking. I don't wanna do it as part of my PhD, but I'll propose and throw out the, the idea out there. So the application is a Lagrangian nonlinear maneuvering and sea keeping model for underwater vehicles. This model is a time domain model for the prediction of forces of near surface vehicles operating in waves. Um, like I said, it's a Lagrangian model. So it's constructed from first principle energy considerations with minimal linearization assumptions. Um, so there's different assumptions um, based on just steady forward speed, um, typical like kind of sea keeping assumptions, uh, small perturbation theory. Um, and this model will inform the construction of different energy-based control laws. Um, and in the control theory world, these energy-based control laws are kind of up and coming um, and kind of a new theory and way to do things. So this model will help create dynamically feasible trajectories. So kind of in this cartoon at the bottom, if we have a torpedo near, near the free surface and we want it to go on this particular trajectory, which makes a pretty sharp left-hand turn, is that body actually able to make that trajectory? Um, it will also provide robust motion feedback for health monitoring of systems. So if we have, say, a glider that is operating 
um, we can throw the, the body into this model and see if it's behaving how we expect it to behave. Um, and then kind of one of my professors keyed this term, it can also provide pseudo feed forward disturbance rejection. So if we see an incoming wave, we can predict the disturbance that will be caused by that wave and kind of in advance change the dynamics of the body to uh, disturb that rejection or reject that disturbance. Um, so just kind of the model, the Lagrangian for an impulsive motion not incorporating memory effects takes this kind of form um, where we can kind of ne neglect for now different buoyancy effects or asymmetric effects due to the body. And we're left with just a, a system of different added masses. Um, we have the, just the rigid body added mass or rigid body mass, a deeply submerged added mass and then two different corrections that account for the asymmetry of the free surface, and then another added mass correction that accounts for the actual deformations of the free surface. So in the construction of this model, there were some simplifications added earlier on to create these added mass matrices using potential flow functions. Um, but what I want to do now is kind of get rid of those potential flow assumptions and see what kind of nonlinear nonlinearities we can increase uh, put into the, the system. So that creates a larger scope for this project, just focused on near surface submerged vessel hydrodynamics as a whole. Um, you can have analytical approaches, you can have computations using linear and nonlinear boundary element methods, and even rant solvers. And really, uh, at a conference I gave a presentation I gave last month at OMAE. I wanted to identify areas of discrepancy in the adoption of these linearized uh, free surface boundary conditions for straight ahead motion of near surface vehicles. So the project goal was to compare different hydrodynamic forces and free surface elevations using a linearized free surface boundary element method and open foam where I used inner foam with different local time stepping to get a steady state solution and mules compression to maintain a sharp interface at the free surface. I set the viscosity to a value very close to zero to closely mimic the boundary element method solution. And I had uh, include slip uh, walls and then a moving slip condition on the body that would be moving. And this body was subjected to uh, several different submergences and a range of uh, forward speeds ranging from fruit number 0 0.2 to 0 0.9. And like any good CFD uh, person would, I have my mesh convergence results for this body in open foam at a range of different depths and three different speeds that covers the entire range of fruit numbers. Um, and looking at these mesh convergence, we see good monotonic convergence across the range um, of simulations. Um, and they behave in kind of an asymptotic way that we would expect and want them to. Um, and I'm able to create a chart like this, which shows the, the wave resistance force over the range of um, forward speeds and a range of depths comparing the boundary element method and open foam. Uh, the boundary element method was ager. It was a, a Rankine source uh, boundary element method. And we can see that open foam consistently results in larger wave resistance forces um, compared to the boundary element method over the range of fruit numbers and the range of depths, um, peaking at a, a consistent fruit number where wave making resistance is greatest, signifying that the difference between these two results is due to the nonlinearities contained in the free surface. Um, but I really wanna focus on what happens physically in this system as the submergence increases, as the body gets further away from the free surface, or as fruit numbers get really, really small. And I mean, the, the main thing is that waves get smaller. Um, so we have this diminishing uh, free surface waves. And the way that I showed that mesh convergence, I was using the same meshes throughout for all of the different cases. Um, but a big problem happens between say a fruit number 0 0.2 when the body is close to the free surface, and through number 0 0.55. The free surface deformation is severely diminished when the speed is low. We don't create that many waves. And if the mesh is created in such a way to capture these 
free surface deformations, we're using a lot less cells in the Z direction um, to capture the, the deformation of the free surface. And when we really want a sharp interface and to capture these uh, forces fully, we want 10 to 20 to even more cells in the Z direction to fully capture these waves, which isn't happening here. So if I show this mesh convergence in another way, I'm showing it as a percent error to an extrapolated value. I have four different cases here, uh, two different speeds at two different depths. So of course the, the mesh that, uh, the case that the mesh was really created for was kind of this maximum wave deformation, the, the largest waves being created when the body is close to the surface. And that would be the submergence of one diameter at fruit number 0 0.55, which is the orange curve, which shown as a percent error is pretty close to the, the converged value. But as these wave deformation, deformations begin to decrease, the percent errors grow drastically to where almost no waves are being created. Um, so I wanted to investigate how can we better capture these small deformation waves in such a way that I can create an entire study from it. So that developed into a plan. I want to incre increase the mesh refinement at the free surface, including more cells in the Z, Z direction per wave height. And that will ultimately reduce the need for an additional interpolation of the alpha parameter at the free surface. These smaller cell heights will better capture the sharp gradient of the volume fraction at that interface. I also explored different numerical schemes. Um, so I took a deeper dive into different discretization schemes and linear uh, matrix solver settings. And those can be shown. I threw in them at the end of the, the presentation if there's time or if anybody wants to see them afterwards. I also had a plan to investigate other free surface uh, volume of fluid schemes, such as isode vector or different geometric reconstruction schemes, but I have not had time to complete that yet. So I took really two, I shoot, showed three here, but two different cases um, and took a, a slice down the middle showing the wave elevation um, for a spheroid submerged at one diameter. So looking at fruit numbers 0 0.34 and 0 0.41, um, we see the maximum wave height is reduced by approximately half. Um, and that'll be important later, later on when looking at, for instance, wanting to do a mesh refinement study. If I know that the maximum wave height is reduced by half, why don't I just increase the mesh refinement by two in the Z direction at the free surface and I'll have approximately the same number of cells capturing that wave height. So I looked at two different mesh refinement studies starting with that fruit number 0.41 case. One is a typical three-dimensional refinement, ref, uh, refining all the cells by the same amount in all three directions. And this gives consistent results showing two different mesh refinement levels. And then there's another refinement strategy, which I'm calling the free surface only. So keeping the same kind of background mesh, but only refining in the Z direction around the free surface just to increase the number of cells that are capturing those uh, free surface wave heights. So rerunning a mesh convergence study just on this one case of the body submerged at one diameter at through number 0 0.41, I show the, the two cases. Um, the blue curve is that typical refinement going up to cell counts of about 110 million cells. Uh, the gray curve and the orange curve is the free, the free surface only refinement shown on the two different relative scales of the cell counts. So the gray curve is shown on the absolute scale, um, but the orange curve is shown on its own scale, kind of like you would view it on its own. And we can see that refining just the free surface compared to the entire domain, we get a relatively similar convergence pattern. It's still monotonic, it's still behaving in an asymptotic way like we would expect, but retaining almost a 10th number of the cells, meaning that we can run our simulations much quicker. Um, now looking at the alpha parameter, looking at the free surface sharpness, um, we see that the free surface Z only is able to get a much sharper surface at the free surface um, because we can go through many more refinement cycles um, and still have less cells. Um, there, there is one thing that I want to point out, and then that's at the, the first uh, crest behind the body. 
And because we're only refining in the Z direction, we're not refining along the lengthwise portion of the body. So we still have some smearing along that direction, which the three-dimensional refinement is refining those and is better able to capture those gradients. Now, looking at the lower fruit number, which I said has about a maximum wave height that is approximately half, I looked at two different mesh refinement strategies here also. Again, I have the original that was shown in blue, um, but then I also have, assuming that I'm using double the amount of cells to capture the free surface, just running the traditional three-dimensional refinement, but having an extra level of refinement in the Z direction at the free surface to double the number of cells at the free surface. Um, this keeps the number of cells per wave height similar to the fruit number 0.41 case, but increases the total cell count in the same fashion. Um, and this actually doesn't immediately improve convergence results and drastically still increases the number of cells. So I'm not real sure what's going on there. So there's some possible problems. Um, smaller wave elevations re may uh, require even more Z refinement, more than just a particular number of cells per wave height. Um, and this will require, require better quality meshes from the onset, um, because if we try to get these high aspect ratio cells, some will become inverted depending on your measure. Um, another thing is the shorter wavelengths will require more cells in the, the wavelength direction that isn't necessarily be, being refined in that way. Or simply, it's just the nature of the beast trying to capture these small magnitude forces, and we'll just have to find a way to be content with these kinds of errors. Um, so possible solutions that I have and thought of going forward, one is to use overset meshing to maintain that Cartesian background um, at the free surface interface so I can do some of these um, better quality meshes at the free surface. Another one um, is an, kind of a more automated meshing strategy, kind of like AMR, but more focused on using these physical quantities. So if I'm able to output the wave height it'll refine to a particular number of cells in that wave height, or the same thing for the wavelength. Um, and this is different than AMR that just refines up to a particular cell level, um, but more so defines the number of cells I want in, the, in this region. And then also exploring other free surface capturing methods such as free surface tracking using the ISO vector method using geometric reconstruction, or as people use the, the ghost fluid level set method. So some general conclusions, convergence results can be presented in ways that make, make them appear good enough. Like I did in that first one, I, I was able to show that they're all monotonic, they all be, behave asymptotically, but as we plot them against one another, some have much greater errors compared to their asymptotic values than other ones. Um, I showed there's lots of different numerical schemes that are involved in free surface flows and they can have a large effect on simulation stability and accuracy. Like I said, if you want to see those, I can show you those afterwards. And then different meshing strategies can be used if knowledge about the system is known prior. So if we know what the approximate wave height is going to be, we can stuff as many cells into that problem area as we need to, to uh, rectify it. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you for that. For working with us. <laughs> okay. So, in general, I'll, I'll ask you a question. Mm -hmm. okay. When you studied your flow figures, did you try zooming in onto the free surface and looking for effective parasitic flows? Yes. And, and you, using just traditional inner foam, there are parasitic velocities. This is your main problem. Okay. So, in translation, level set will do nothing. Overset will do nothing for you. You need ISO vector, which is going to give you a perfect free surface, even if the mesh is coarse. And you need those to vector the way the mesh jump conditions. I think you're going to enjoy the next time you ask for that. <laughs> so I think this is a good work. You really know what you're doing, mm -hmm. but you just need the better set. Thank you. Uh, so I 
mesh it here, it's just around the body. So almost creating a, a body fitted mesh where the free surface is still in the background and you just have the overset around the body that's not intersecting with the free surface. So you're not doing any sort of interpolation of the alpha parameter into the overset portion. Maybe just some further comments. So this morning I said that ABS won't be responsible for the resistance with error less than half a percent. Okay. You have a chance of doing that because the entire body is wet. Mm -hmm. so you don't have to request error perception. Okay. The second thing is when we first went to the 2015 uh, Tokyo workshop, there was a study of a shift in regular head rates. And the mistake that we made was to make the same mesh for all weight classes. So I would advise that you have one starting mesh, establish what the weight type is, and then rebuild the mesh with the final principle of the weight type to get this high reaction. Yeah, and that's kind of the, the point I was getting to with this automated, like you have a starting mesh, you're able, yeah, but, but maybe not so integrated into the- AMR is done. Yeah. And you have breaks. Mm -hmm. so doing what you like AMR to do for you by hand will give you a better result. Yeah. Uh, so when you say make the overset domain, make it longer. Yeah.